So yeah, I'm your chat moderator, Asian A. Thomas. I'm the director of the leadership programs. And our presenters today are the LFI team, which is Laura Hall, Casey Stratton, Priscilla Cano, and Frank Vaca. And I'll pass it over to you all. Hi, I'm Frank Vaca. My pronouns are he, his, them. I'm the LFI coordinator, and I enjoy my job at MDRC. Um, it allows me to um, help 18 to 26-year-olds with their advocacy skills and leadership skills. So I'll turn it over to my next present, uh, the next presenter. My name is Laura Hall. I'm one of the directors of the LFI program, and I use she, her pronouns. Hello, my name is Priscilla Cano. I'm the bilingual disability advocate, and I use she, her, a, yeah. So a little bit about what the LFI program is. Um, LFI stands for Leaders for Inclusion, and it is a program uh, funded by the Deve Developmental Dis Michigan Developmental Disabilities Council to um, provide individuals and organizations with tools and resources to develop leadership and create more inclusive spaces. So we do that in a couple of ways. Um, the first is our, le our leadership program. It's a program for um, young adults age 18 to 26 with, with intellectual and developmental disabilities. Uh, they want to gain opportunities and resources to grow their leadership skills. So we spend a year long uh, program with the LFI ambassadors, teaching them uh, a lot of these skills. The second part of the program is our leaders for inclusion um, work that we do with organizations. So we provide uh, training on disability pride and inclusion to organizations that are interested in becoming more inclusive of people with disabilities. And then beyond that, we like uh, we provide technical assistance to organizations that are looking to implement authentic inclusion practices. So we uh, look at inclusion from both fronts, the individual and the organization. Next slide.
Ezra mentioned that they are, sorry, one second, non-binary lesbian, social work student, disability advocate, cat parent, and Muppet lover. Love it. Ashley, non-binary lesbian, cat parent, mental health advocate, animal rescuer. <laughs> So um, we'll start with a picture of Kimberly Crenshaw, who coined the term in 1989 to address how Black women existed at the intersections of racism and sexism. Um, it takes into account people's overlapping identities and experiences. Um, disability justice framework uses the same idea. The disability justice framework applies this concept by explaining that disabled people each have a different background and experience regarding race, class, sexuality, age, immigration status, and other issues. Recognizing intersectionality means recognizing the apparent ideologies such as ableism, racism, sexism, xenophobia, homophobia, and transphobia often operate together and empower one another. Next slide. Intersectionality is a critical lens and approach, not a collection of identities. This is an acknowledgement that one person can experience different types of discrimination based on their identities. Without acknowledging this, the goal of any movement cannot be achieved. And on the corner, there's a diagram of intersectional identities. So some on, on there are race, religion, disability, class, trauma, relational status, gender, and sexual identity. Now, Frank will talk to us about the facets of life. So the facets of life um, involve self-care, relationships we have, the politics we may be involved with, the employment that we seek, the hobbies that we have, the social activities that we have, and the values. You can um, like put yourself in the middle of this and all around you have the facets of your life. Can I go to the next slide? Sure. So this is my facets of life. Um, I'm an avid um, reader of books. I like to collect certificates and um, I have my associate's degree um, in general um, ed. Um, I support equality and fairness um, in my hometown. Um, I go about um, transportation um, through um, public transportation, like eTran. I love to bowl. Um, I like to make digital art. And um, quite um, the advocate when it comes to um, parades and rallies, um, as you see in the corner. Uh, I have a partner um, of eight years. Um, he's with me um, in my cap and gown. And um, yeah, all this makes up me. Uh, I wouldn't be any less or any more than um, what my disability and my um, sexual orientation is gay. I'm non-binary, um, but anything less or any more um, would different um, my uh, myself. So those are my facets of life. Ready for the next slide? Mm -hmm. So what gets in the way of pride, homophobia, and animalism? Next slide. So what is ableism? Um, ableism is discriminating against, oppressing, or excluding people with disabilities 
because we of what we think they're able to do or not do. Um, and it's a situation where people without disabilities have power over people with disabilities. So there are um, several pictures in this slide that give examples of ableism. One is um, a picture of a person in a wheelchair and they're holding a sign that says, can you have sex? Which is um, pointing to some of the um, invasive curiosity that people often have about people with disabilities asking inappropriate questions because they see them really as more objects of curiosity. There's also um, somebody holding a sign that says, you don't look disabled. Um, it can also be ableist language like confined to a wheelchair, um, falling on deaf ears or you're acting bipolar or some other examples of how language can be ableist. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about language um, coming up here in the slides. Frank, I think we're ready to go to the next slide. So ableism is, um, can be really harmful to the person, not only just because it exists in our world, but because it's so easy for someone to internalize the messages that they hear about having a disability, um, what it means, how you're valued in life. Um, and when you hear these messages enough, it's hard to resist not turning them inward. And that's where internalized ableism comes in. So we start to believe the ableist messages that surround us about disabled bodies. Um, and that's why it's so important to have disability pride, which we're gonna talk about. Um, the picture on this slide is a person in a wheelchair with some thought bubbles that say, I will never get a job. I'm not good enough. I'm broken and need to be fixed. I'm asking for too much. And these are really common thoughts of a person who may be experiencing internalized ableism, um, feeling like a burden, not feeling powerful enough, feeling like they need to be fixed, feeling as though their disability is the, the problem, um, when really it's society that's the problem. So I think we're okay to move to the next slide, Frank. Now we're gonna look at the models of disability as well. Um, the medical model and the social model. So um, under the medical model, disability is seen as a problem, a deficit or something abnormal. Um, people with disabilities are suffering and have a lower quality of life. The remedy is for the person to be fixed or made as normal as possible. Um, Medical professionals and social service providers are the best to provide treatment, interventions, and make decisions. And medical intervention is the best way to, to achieve independence, which is often for people with disabilities, independence is seen as the ultimate goal. Um, we argue against that because it, it's the idea that none of us are truly independent. We all rely on other people for things in our lives. Can we go to the next slide, please? Under the social model of disability, um, disability is part of who we are. It's an identity that we can take pride in. It is societal barriers and not our disabilities. So barriers like lack of access, attitudes, stereotypes that limit the person and impact their quality of life. The remedy, is for society to remove barriers, change attitudes, and provide inclusion. Um, under the social model, people with disabilities are the experts on their own lives and bodies. It can make decisions about what is best. And greater independence can be achieved if societal barriers were removed. So really just taking this idea that the problem, the thing that needs to be changed, fixed, it's not the disability, but it's those societal things out in life that create barriers for people that need to be changed. Next slide.
Yep. Yep. And let me just make sure I've added the sound. And let me stop sharing and share it um, from YouTube. One moment. Should it sound good? Yep. Uh, and captions on the captions. Yep. Here we go. Hi, I'm Daisy. I use they, them pronouns, and I'm queer and I'm disabled. Daisy walking with a cane, wearing a rainbow colored cap and t shirt that says, The future is accessible. I've been disabled since birth, and growing up, I had a lot of surgeries and physical therapies in order to reach certain physical benchmarks that doctors told me I was supposed to have reached at my age. Daisy is joined by two friends who wear rainbow and trans pride flags. I was told to stretch my hamstring this way, to turn my foot that way, walk straighter, stand taller, and basically make my body fit into other people's standards that were never really within my reach to begin with. I had no access to disabled role models in the media or in my personal life. I had no way of thinking about my disability outside of a medical context. And as a result, I totally internalized the idea that my disability was a bad thing that needed medical intervention in order to be fixed. At the same time, as I was going through adolescence, I started realizing that I wasn't straight. Luckily, I had some out friends, supportive teachers, and an active gay-straight alliance that really supported me and helped me process what that meant for me. Daisy and their friends arrive at Pride, multicolored flags in the background. Even though I started to feel real pride in my queer identity, there was this entire part of me, my disability, that I didn't get to celebrate like I did my queerness. For example, I once had someone that I matched with on a lesbian dating app tell me, Aw, it's okay, babe. I still think you're beautiful. I'll take care of you. After I told her I was disabled. Daisy cringes. Yeah, that was bad. <laughs> I just wanted to scream, you don't have to tell me it's okay to be disabled. I know it's okay. I don't need you to take care of me, and I don't need your apology just for existing as myself. In that moment, it hit me extra hard that the queer community isn't always disability inclusive. All I could think was, well, I guess this community isn't really mine after all. I started connecting with people who are unapologetic about being both queer and disabled. I met people who took rules about what men and women were supposed to do or how bodies were supposed to look and rewrote them, revised them, or threw them away entirely. And then I realized that I could apply the same thing to my own life, not only in terms of my queerness, but in terms of my disability as well. I slowly started to experiment with bow ties, button downs, backwards hats, and other markers of gender outside of the feminine norm. I also started using my cane when I actually needed it, rather than feeling ashamed of it. I realized that I could invite people to stare on my own terms and find pride, confidence, and empowerment in that. Now, dressing like this is like a visual representation of all the ways my body is defiant of norms and expectations. Daisy showing off their outfit. What I've learned from this is that disability is an identity in its own right. And being able to claim that identity may take some time. I mean, I was born disabled, and it took me years and years. Photo of Daisy. Their t-shirt reads, queer and disabled. I don't have to be ashamed. My disability isn't just a medical condition. My body doesn't need to be fixed, and I am so, so proud of that. Pride and comfort aren't inherent, but shame doesn't have to be either. Daisy shares a milkshake with their partner. Their faces gently touch. We're all on our own journey to understanding what it means to be queer, disabled, trans, whatever it may be. Know that wherever you are in that process, your journey is valid and you are not alone in it. Written and directed by Daisy Whistler. To learn more about storytellers like me, visit rootedinrights.org slash storytellers. <laughs>
Yep. So what's the gain? Self-esteem, self-acceptance, support systems, a sense of belonging, accommodations, value of interdependence, a life of honesty, and being whole, your whole self, and appreciation for diversity. Naomi Ortiz says people who haven't found pride aren't living. Okay, um, we're going to talk about some of the building blocks of pride, and um, those include language, acknowledging your disability, um, working on inclusion in your community or in your life, understanding the disability history and culture of the, dis of the pride movement, the disability pride movement, and practice is the final building block. Next slide, please. So understanding disability and LGBTQIA history, both the disability and the LGBTQIA plus are diverse communities that have been the target historical oppression and resistance throughout history. Our communities have a rich culture, history and justice movement. Both movements were inspired by the civil rights movement in the 1950s and 60s. Um, for this, oppression is defined as discriminating against a group of people, treating them unfairly, having policies or laws that hurt a particular group of people, having attitudes towards people that are negative, and resistance is fighting back against oppression, making progress, advocating for change. Next slide. Oh, sure can. The parallels between movements. The LGBT community has Pride Month, which is on June. It is the anniversary of the Stonewall riots. Um, LGBTQIA people were um, considered sick, broken, and in need of fixing, forced to hide themselves from society, believed to be dangerous and immoral, fighting to be accepted rather than pathologized or pitied. Uh, choosing their own language to describe themselves. And uh, the disability community has Pride Month in July. It's the anniversary of the ADA. Their um, disability people were considered um, sick and broken and in need of fixing, hidden away from society and institutions, believed to be dangerous and immoral, fighting to be included rather than uh, pathologized or pitied, and choosing their own language to describe themselves. So there's parallels between the movements. Next slide.
I want to say 36, I could be wrong, but. And there was support from other, um, from pride movements, from, from the, from the um, LGBT movement to help, um, like I know the, Gay Man's Butterfly Brigade brought food in for the people with disabilities who were in the in the building, trying to help them sustain the movement. Um, oh, and somebody else, Kelsey, at another point in history, Asian, could you read that, please? Yeah, um, I was going to add that to Laura that the Civil Rights Movement also assisted with the. Um, Sit in. So another intersectionality that Kelsey pointed out um, is that the Black Panther supported the sit-in and delivered meals and supplies.
Kelsey gave you a big heart, Casey. 
I'll take it. So Kate Davidson, uh, 1992 to 2014, was an autistic transgender advocate for social justice, a White House champion of change a recipient, uh, created disability solidarity um, hashtag to support coordination between disability and racial justice movements, and created the um, hashtag love wins hashtag. You're muted, Priscilla. Thank you, Laura. Um, 1970s to now, Dr. Lavos created both therapies, and I use that in quotation marks, that uses electrical shock devices to interrupt self injurious or aggressive behavior in autism and other developmental disabilities, as well as conversion therapy for the LGBTQIA plus community. Um, in May 9, in May 2018, activists from the disability rights organization ADAPT camped outside of FDA Director Scott's home, Scott Lib's home, for over two weeks. Activists were protesting the use of electric shocks as a treatment for unwanted behavior in people with autism and other disabilities at the Judge Rothenberg Center in Massachusetts. The FDA banned electric shock devices, but did not have the authority to do so. So in 2023, Massachusetts Supreme Court determined the FDA needed Congress to authorize them to have the authority to ban electric shock therapy, resulting in two court cases between 2021 and 2023 around this issue. Congress passed the law giving the FDA the authority to ban it again and are now in the process of doing so. Next slide. Okay, earlier we talked a little bit about language um, and how that can be an important piece in the pride movement, um, particularly how language changes over time and language that is um, adopted by community. So just going through a few terms, of offensive in the disability community are words like retarded, handicapped, crippled, um, referring to people as those people. Um, spaz, psycho, or crazy. Um, and we often get a lot of pushback on the word crazy, but really it's just the idea that crazy, like the word psycho, like the word spaz, um, has been used to describe someone's experience and probably has been used to oppress them at some point in their life. Um, like Casey was saying, the word queer took some some getting used to because that was just a word that um, was used as a, as a slander. Um, so it's important to pay attention to those words too. Even as a team, we pay attention to that and started saying like, wow, that's really wild or what else can we say instead of crazy? So um, there's, thriving or, or there's surviving language, which is words like differently able, handicapable, disability with a capital A. Um, these are words that have been uh, for largely like created outside of the disability community by other people. So that's why we call them surviving language. Uh, that's why we call it surviving language because sometimes um, <clears throat> this is written into things that we would not choose normally to have the words, uh, these words used. But the problem behind these words and where a lot of people get caught up is we just don't want to give the impression that disability is a bad word by making it sound um, better. So differently able, handy, capable, disability are all ways of not using the word just disability or disabled. Um, and then we move to thriving language, which, which I think is what all of us are used to. Things like person first language. Um, I'm a person with a disability. Or it could be identity first, like uh, someone who is deaf, blind, autistic, or just um, 
refers to themselves as a disabled person, so taking on that disability identity in the way that they refer to themselves. And if we can go to the next slide, Casey's going to go through some parallels.
As Ezra made a great point in the comments. Um, as I said, I think it's also important to highlight that people in both communities have started to reclaim some of these words seen as offensive. For example, the video shown was called Crip Queer Pride, and the person in the video used those words as affirming for themselves. Um, team, do you have a response for that? Or something to add on? It's a very great point. Um, reclaiming some of those words, yep. Yeah. Ezra, I just want to say, um, just to everyone that's on the Zoom now, like even um, when we talk about like thriving language and surviving language, um, we language in general, well, we're going to get into how, you know, words have power and it's very important, but it's very important to also just acknowledge and asking people how they identify, how they want to, um, want people like, I'm trying to move away from saying preferred, <laughs> but how um, people identify and how they show up in the world. And um, so when it comes to disability, you know, if someone is saying, if someone is like, yeah, I prefer to be called autistic or a person with autism. Uh, so it's just very important to like talk to that person about um, the words that they would like to, to use to describe themselves. Okay, so why why is language why does it matter um, the the language that we use? A lot of people just say it changes so often I can't keep up. What do you expect me to do? Well, language is powerful, and it's been used to oppress and empower people throughout history. That's one reason why it matters. Um, and to not acknowledge that there's been changes in language is to not honor that there's been advocacy. Um, pride and strive in the movements that we that we've worked on and worked hard for the, that language to change. And as Aisha A. mentioned, um, language is often a clue as to how somebody identifies. So listening carefully to how somebody uses their language is often a clue as to how they identify. Next slide. Acknowledging your disability. This is one of the building blocks of disability pride. Um, acknowledging that it can be difficult, especially for people whose disabilities are not apparent. Society so and ableism tells us that it's better to hide and act and be the same. Um, but acknowledging your disability is powerful. It's claiming your identity and allowing you to ask for what you need. And in acknowledging our disabilities, um, we're not living a lie. Um, I have a physical disability, which is very visible. So there is no, you know, hiding the fact that I have a disability or, or that not being seen. Um, but to people that I've talked to whose disabilities aren't apparent, they've said that had they've had that feeling of living a lie and not um, being connected to the community, not getting the accommodations they need. Um, so that's important to acknowledge that if you have a disability. And it's also important, as Casey said earlier, we don't just want to talk about disability pride like it's um, toxic positivity. It's important to acknowledge the losses and the gifts of our disability. So taking time to, to kind of grieve the losses as well and the gifts and focus on the gifts. Um, I think the important thing is not to get stuck in the losses for a long period of time. Next slide. Um, a little bit about inclusion. 
Inclusion are the steps that are taken to make sure that every everyone feels welcome and belongs. It's making space for people to be who they are and all of their identities. Um, there needs to be spaces where people with disabilities can be in community with each other, as well as belonging to the larger community. Um, community is important to disability pride. So a lot of times, people with disabilities are kind of forced into groups with each other. So maybe the uh, transportation goes on Thursday from the uh, adult foster care home to bowling. And that may not necessarily mean, be a, a community of people that people wanna be in with every week. That's why it's important that people have a say in who they are, are in community with. And it's important for people to have a chance to be together with people with disabilities, but people with disabilities of their choosing, as well as not only just together with people, other people with disabilities, but part of the larger community itself. Um, and that just kind of speaks to a lot of these community programs that we have that are created and ran by people without disabilities. Um, part of our work as an LFI team is to really work with organizations that run community programs to, to ensure that uh, people with disabilities have a voice in how they gather as a community. So that's the important thing to remember about inclusion. The ultimate goal is we want to make people feel as though they belong, but they are the only ones that can say that for themselves. Next slide. Is this one me? I thought this was you, Frank. Oh, thank you. So how to help others develop pride. Spending time in the community with other people, Develop and show your own pride. Learn more about the history of marginalized communities. Um, confront ableism and homophobia and help others reframe internalized ableism and homophobia. Join cross-issue justice movements. Examine your own identities and how they impact who you are and practice the final building block. Next slide. Before um, talking about disability justice, just to add to the um, how to um, help others and in inclusion, um, joining committees for events that you attend and you see that they're not accessible is a big one. I learned that this year. Um, I went to a couple of, uh, I went to a conference where I noticed that things were not accessible and I could point them out. And I made the decision that this coming up year when that conference comes around and they ask for suggestions or committee members that I was going to join to have that voice for the disability community to um, be able to advocate for accessibility. So that's another one. Um, for disability justice, so disability justice is the, it was a framework created in 2005 by queer disabled activists of color, Hattie Byrne, Mia Mingus, and Stacey Melbourne. They did this to expand upon the disability rights movement, which established civil rights for people with disabilities. In the San Francisco Bay Area, disability justice was built in reaction to their exclusion from mainstream disability rights movements and disability study discourse and activism, as well as the ableism in activist spaces. They were later joined by Leroy Moore, Eli Clark, and uh, Eli Claire, and Sebastian Margaret. Disability justice, centers, dis disability justice centers disabled people of color, immigrants with disabilities, queers with disabilities, trans and gender, non-conforming people with disabilities, people with disabilities who are houseless, people with disabilities who are incarcerated, people with disabilities who have had their ancestral land stolen, amongst others. Next slide. So remember, you weren't the one who made you ashamed, but you are the one who can make you proud. Just practice. Practice until you get proud. And once you are proud, keep practicing so you won't forget. You get proud by practicing. Laura Hershey. Next that brings us to the end of our presentation today. Thank you so much for hanging with us. Does anyone have any questions? We are 
completely willing to hang on and answer any questions anyone has or comments. Kelsey said thanks very much. Good to see you, Laura. You too, Kelsey. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Um, Frank, can you go to the next slide? It just has all the contact information for the LFI team. Um, if you all would like the LFI team to come out to your organization, or if you know of an organization that could use um some some more training on disability awareness. Um, or even the intersections of LGBTQIA and disability, um, please reach out. The LFI email is leaders at mymdrc.org. I'll put it in the chat too. Tamika said, great job. Thank you, Tamika. Are you able to hear me? Yes. Now we can. Yep. Awesome. Um, I have a question I was trying to put in the chat, but it wasn't letting me type. Um, I organize events and um, have one coming up that's a camping event. Uh, the property itself is accessible for mobility disabilities. Uh, and we are doing performances and workshops throughout the week. And my question is around, in the past, we've always hired and, and provided ASL interpreters at these events, um, but uh, at times they they are not necessary. There's no one at the event who needs ASL interpreting. And so we're uh, considering trying to put some sort of a question into the registration for the event to ask about uh, accessibility needs of the participants. And um, I just would like to know your thoughts on that. Uh, you know, I have some mixed feelings about that it should just always be provided, period. And then that way you don't have to worry about it. But also we're not only on a budget, we're probably digging into our own pockets to produce the event, uh, even though we're charging for it. And it's pretty pricey to get ASL interpreters. So if it's not something that anyone who's attending is going to need, we we don't really have the funds to spend on that. So anyone have comments or thoughts about that? Well, I can take this one. <laughs> um, I think so. My first question is: um, do, Does everyone have to like pre-register to attend? Like, is it? Something they where, um, okay, so yes, I would definitely add that to your registration um, on if they need that accommodation or not. Um, and um, you by you already having um, the means to be able to even know like where that resource is, like that's a great start. Like some people don't even know where to start or don't even think about um, having ASL interpret interpretation um, available um, if, it, if the request even came through. Um, another thing um, about the interpreter and they not being used, um, are you outreaching to people that are a part of the um, deaf community um, to to you to utilize the ASL interpreters? So maybe yes. even thinking more about outreaching to the community so that it is like something that, that is used and that people are actually attending um, your event. But I think um, adding that as a question in the registration would be helpful for you too. Uh, that's all very helpful. And yes, we do reach out to deaf, hard of hearing uh, community as well, uh, which is why we just automatically were providing them before. Mm -hmm. um, and do you, do you all have any suggestions about a more broad kind of question to ask on a registration that would use language that's appropriate um, to ask about what sorts of accommodation might be needed? Yes. Yeah, so on our, oh, go ahead, go ahead Angela. I was just gonna say on our registration form, we just add, we just ask um, really, so we try to frame it because sometimes people don't like to seem like they're asking for too much 
Um, so we like to frame it as what do you need to be able to thrive in the space or to be successful in the space? So to actively participate and um, be in the space, not only just we want to invite you and you're you feel included in that way, but when you're actually there that you can actively participate. So um, we frame it as, um, you know, what are your accommodation needs? And then we have instead of them having to type it out, we have them actually select um, different options. So like we'll have ASO interpreter as an option, live captioning, um, if they need, uh, depending on the event, if they need um, accessible bathrooms or anything like that, like we try to add that already there so that they can just click which accommodations they need. Um, and we find that that's more helpful than them having to type it out. Um, yeah. And so they kind of, they know that we're thinking of that accommodation for them. And sometimes people don't think of it, you know, on a registration. Yeah. yeah. And that we can provide that. Yeah. And there are also things that we do just um, to be inclusive of everyone. So we work with younger people, and, but, and maybe this isn't an issue for your event, but you know, just having sensory things for people to use, fidget spinners, things to draw mm -hmm. and color with, um, on tables as as we have events going on, people will just pick them up and it's not even really an accommodation. It's just something that we have available because we have some long events and, and people, you know, respond well to having something um, that they can do while we're talking. So oh, that's just, a great suggestion. Thank you. Just a thought, yeah. Our um kind of rule of thumb too is like, if it's a pre-registered event uh, where people do have to like RSVP, um, we go by those. But if it's a public event where anyone could join, um, you know, if they choose to join last minute, that's when we just provide all accommodations without, you know. Um, needing that pre-register. So if it's something where you feel where people are, they have to register to even attend, um, then, you know, I would go strictly by like what accommodation these people, people have. And set that that is, yeah, that is so helpful because like I said, in my mind, it's like, we just should make it available period. But it, since it is registered and, and we have had some issues in the past where we've provided it, but there's nobody watching, you know, mm -hmm. um, it's, it makes a lot more sense, especially on a tight budget. Yeah. And just I think just acknowledge, you know, just the, the fact that you are already putting, thinking about that in the planning process to have it in, as part of your budget to even ask for the accommodation, like that's a great first step of being inclusive. Thank you for that question. Any other questions? You had a few um, comments in the chat. Gianna said, thank you, excellent work. Ezra said, thank you for this comprehensive overview. Thank you both. Thank you to our interpreter and our cart captioner. Tammy and our interpreter, Audrey, appreciate you both for taking the time. All right, uh, I don't see anything in the chat. All right. Well, thank you, everyone, for joining us. We appreciate it. Um, follow us on Facebook. Join our listserv.